Okay, thank you, Lisa. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks for spending your Monday evening with me. Uh, for me, Mondays are the most challenging days at the practice, and um, I personally am always tempted to just relax when I come home on a Monday evening and not attend some CE course, especially if it's a super boring CE course. So um, I'm going to do my best to make it unboring and try to show you the appreciation you deserve for actually joining me. A um, couple things before we get started. If you have your phone with you, or if you're just on a web browser on your computer, go ahead and go on this website here. It's pollev.com slash slash Ankur Gupta 701. I'm going to be asking you some questions. We're going to be doing some real-time surveys. Um, and I'd like you all to participate in these surveys. And so if you could just go on that website, you don't know what the survey question is or anything like that, but it'll allow you to be able to answer some of the survey questions I have throughout this presentation. It's actually really nice. It, it's a way for you to anonymously contribute and for, um, and for this to be a little bit more of an interactive presentation. So just before I get started, I do want to ask, um, there's about a handful of people who are have joined us now on this call. Go ahead and open up your chat box and just write where you're from. It just um, It's interesting for me to see where all of the viewers are coming from, what part of the country, or if they're coming from Canada, etc. So if you go on the chat and just type where you're from, I'd appreciate it. And then the last thing before I get started is Everything that I talk about, is, I make a handout for. And so um, my handouts are all non-proprietary. So I never make it so that people have to sign some type of membership or anything like that in order to access my handouts. They're all downloadable. You can print them out. You can make them part of a workshop that you do with your own team. Um, you can print them out and sell them on the street. I don't really care. Um, I just want to make sure that they're totally available to you. Um, they're available on this Catapult Education platform, and they're also available on my website, BeBetterSeminars.com. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be talking about dental implants and a, a better posture today, but those handouts are available. And so if you find them interesting, go ahead and print them out. So it looks like we have a ton of people from Texas. Welcome. Welcome, Texas. All right. So back in 2014, the American Dental Association, they, they gave out a survey to like 100,000 offices. I think I might have gotten this survey, but I totally ignored it. They had 964 offices actually responded to this survey. And the survey question was simple. The question was, what makes your office extraordinary? What makes it unique? What makes your office different from any office down the street? And these were the answers that were given. Our office is friendly. We're the friendliest office. We have superior clinical skills, amazing customer service. Our technology is very advanced, or we have a very clean office. These were the responses. Actually, over 80% of the respondents to this question, what makes your office extraordinary? What makes it unique? What makes it special? What makes it different? 80% of the respondents said either friendly, superior clinical skills, excellent customer service, amazing technology, and cleanliness. Now, I want you to think about your office. Would you say that all of these things apply to you? I would say that everybody that's on this call, you're pretty friendly. Um, I, I would think that we all have pretty good clinical skills, at least we have the best clinical skills that we can. We're conscientious and we try our best, um, that we show great customer service. This doesn't make anybody unique. This is, this is ordinary. This is what all offices are. We're all friendly. We all try our best to have extraordinary, uh, to have special clinical skills. We try our best to have incredible customer service. That's, we're all doing it. So what makes an ordinary team extraordinary? And I thought about this a lot. You know, I'm I'm a very flawed human. I you know I I went bald when I was in my 20s. I have hair growing out of my ears. I'm a you know I get I lose my temper easily. I I just I have all sorts of things that are just not great with me. 
but I want to have an extraordinary dental office. I really do. I want my office to be the best office like in town. I want people to be like, wow, this is amazing. It's, it's incredible here. But how does an ordinary person achieve extraordinary? And that's what all of us are going to be spending the next one hour and 54 minutes talking about. And in order to do that, so today's goal is to achieve extraordinary. And in order to do that, I have to tell you about my 13-year-old daughter. See, I have a 13-year-old daughter, and she still likes me, kind of. She still uh, kind of doesn't mind hanging out with me, which is crazy because she's 13. And I know that at some point, I'm just going to wake up one day, and she's not going to like me anymore. She's just not going to want to hang out with me. My jokes aren't going to be that funny. My stories aren't going to be that interesting. I know how it goes. I have enough friends who have teenage daughters. There's just going to be this point in which my 13 year old daughter stops wanting to hang out with me. So I know that, I know that that's gonna happen. I also know that my lawn, I don't really care how, about how my lawn looks. I just don't care. I, I, I grew up with immigrant parents. You know, my dad was pretty bad about edging and, and mulching and doing all that kind of stuff. And I just, I, I, acquired that same philosophy about curb appeal. I just don't care that much about it. But keep that in mind. As I introduce two types of people, I'm going to introduce to you a hard worker versus a visionary. So two types of people. There's the hard worker and there's the visionary. And I think that if I called any of you a hard worker, you would take that as a compliment. If I was like, wow, you're, you God, look at you. You're just a hard worker. Look at you. You're grinding. You're a hard worker. You'd be like, thanks, man. I am a hard worker. Thanks. I try. You know, I'm a really disciplined hard worker. Good. Good for me. If we call each other hard workers, that's a good thing. As opposed to a visionary. A visionary is kind of weird. I don't think too many of us have been referred to as a visionary before. That's like really high ground for somebody to call me a visionary. That's like, whoa, that's a really a visionary. Wow, that's special. So what's the difference between the two? Well, about four weeks ago, I got a huge big pile of mulch that was dropped off on my driveway. Four weeks ago, huge pile of mulch was dropped on, off on my driveway. And so on Saturday, all day, I was wheelbarrowing mulch out to the flower beds around my house all day. And I was using that little pitchfork thing and I was getting on my hands and knees and, and spreading it around. And when it was all done, my house, my, my lawn had like, I guess, browner mulch and my fingernails were all dirty and I was all sweaty and I was dirty and I walked in and I was like, yeah, I'm a hard worker. And I felt really good about myself because I worked hard. That same evening, my daughter, who actually over the summertime allowed me to go on bike rides with her, that same evening she went on a bike ride herself. And she went for a long time and we got kind of mad at her when she came back because we were like, hey, you were gone for a long time. Like we kind of worried about you. And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know because normally dad goes with me, but tonight he was busy. It was nothing big, it wasn't emotional. But she said, well, dad was busy. And I realized something. This is the difference between a hard worker and a visionary. A visionary is somebody who will take the time to understand the hierarchy of what's important, what they really value, compared to just stuff that needs to be done. And I realized that had I taken the time to think about it, I probably wouldn't have mulched that day because I had an opportunity in that little bit of time that I have left with this kid where she still likes me. And I really value this time that I spend with her still liking me, allowing me to go on bike rides with her, et cetera. I wouldn't have mulched that day. I would have taken the opportunity that I had to spend a little bit of time with her. That's what a visionary is. A visionary is somebody who understands that there's a lot of work that can be done. There's a lot of challenges that need to be accomplished. And a visionary is somebody who prioritizes the most important ones. So how do we determine what's important? Well, how you determine what's important comes from a book that I read a couple of years ago. It's by this guy, Chuck Blakeman. It's a pretty good book. And in that book, there's a sentence from it. And he says, whenever you're doing anything, ask yourself, 
Is this the highest and best use of my time? It makes me think of this uh, this Eisenhower matrix that I saw. You know, here, here's here's what we normally do in a day. We do stuff that's not important and not urgent. That's like uh, looking at Instagram for hours or something like that. That's that's the stuff on the lower right. None of us are proud of that. And then we spend a ton of time on the left side of the screen. A ton of time. We're doing we're doing stuff that's important, right? Like, oh man. Um, the garage needs to be clean. Oh, it's so dirty. I got to get to it. And when you get to work, there's an insurance claim that needs a narrative. And I got to type that up. That's urgent and it's important. We spend a ton of time on the left side of our screen. We might actually spend all of our lives on the left side of the screen doing stuff that's urgent and important or urgent, but not important or something that's urgent might be the fact that you have to clean up your garage because you have some friends coming to visit and you don't want your garage to look dirty. Something like that. That's not really important. It's not gonna really lead to a lot of success in your life, but it's kind of urgent. You feel like you feel a pressure to do it. But what I wanna talk to you is, is this part, right up here, upper right. The stuff that's important, but it's not urgent. And the problem is we can spend our entire life never devoting any time to the upper right, never devoting any time to determining the values that we've created for ourselves. So what is important, but not urgent? It's all the deathbed stuff. The deathbed stuff, what I mean by that is all the stuff, okay, so imagine you're about to die. So you're like laying there and you're, hopefully you're surrounded by like family and friends, who knows, but you're laying there and you're like, oh man, this sucks. I'm about to die, ah, oh, it's terrible. I really don't wanna die. And then you look back at your life and you say, did I live a life that was meaningful? Did I live a life that was purposeful? Did I live a life where I made the world better, at least to the best of my abilities? Based on whatever limitations I have, did I make the world better? And did I make the lives of the, of the people around me better? That's deathbed stuff. So deathbed stuff, in my opinion, is, is stuff like consistent happiness and consistent peace, maximizing relationships, a life free of physical pain, financial stability, or more, more than financial stability, financial peace, where the stress of money is not always looming somewhere around a corner. Love, minimized anxiety, and actually identifying the values you have in your life. I didn't realize that I don't care that much about curb appeal and mulch and flower beds until I actually took the time to think that I had an opportunity to ride a bike with my daughter or I had an opportunity to do something that I truly don't care that much about. And I chose to do the one that I don't care much about because I never took the time to think about the values that I've created my, for myself in life. I've never took the time. Always ask yourself, is this the highest and best use of my time? Now, I want you to take this parameter, this idea of being a visionary, and let's apply that to your practice. A practice that's extraordinary is a practice in which you take the most important values the things that the, at the deathbed of your practice and you make sure that when you are, when you're about to retire and when the practice is at its deathbed, you can say, I did everything I could to make this as meaningful, as purposeful, as superior, as extraordinary and unique and special office as possible. So let me share with you my, my personal long-term vision. This is a, this is a combination of my practice and my personal long-term vision. Here it is. Ready? Okay, every day when I come to work, I'm surrounded by people who I like and respect and they like and respect one another. Every day. The office is efficient, it's beautiful, and it's not grody. And I'm so financially secure, so debt-free, that even when some crisis occurs, it's all good. You know, a year ago, our autoclave just broke. It, it was like we were in the middle of, of doing procedures. And all of a sudden we heard this like weird 
sound. And then all of a sudden, boom. And all this steam came out of the autoclave and it just wouldn't work afterwards. And I realized, you know, when that happened, I realized that 10 years earlier, if that occurred, it would have been a full out crisis. I would have been stressing out. I probably would have been all pissy with my wife and my kids. I would have been irritable and impatient because that would have been a financial crisis. And what's cool is if, if I'm financially secure, if I'm so debt free, if I'm living in a state of financial peace, any crisis is all good. In my long-term vision, I get to escape Cleveland where I live at least three times every winter. My wife and my kids don't hate me. My body doesn't hurt. Even when I'm a grandparent, my body doesn't hurt. I can walk and I run. I, I can do stuff that I know that my father-in-law and my own father can't do. In my long-term vision, that's, what, that's what's important to me. And in my long-term vision as a dentist, I no longer do this. So I know some of you are looking at that and you're like, what's the problem? I don't see anything, any problem there. That's just, uh, you know, all you have to do is a little bit of crown lengthening and just remove the decay and then add a core. Back. Good, good for you. Way to go. In my long-term vision, I just don't do that anymore because in my mind, that's stressful. I know the situation. I go and do a hygiene check and my hygienist has taken bite wings and I look at the bite wings and I see an open margin and I look at Mrs. Jones and I go, Mrs. Jones, we have a problem here. You have an open margin. And she goes, oh no, doctor, what can I do? And I'll be like, don't worry, Mrs. Jones, just pay me a ton of money and trust me that I'll make this all better. And then Mrs. Jones pays me the money and then I stick a needle in her mouth and I pop off the crown and I see that. And that to me is a ruined day because I have no faith in myself that whatever I do is really gonna work out that well. And so for me, my long-term vision, I just don't do this anymore. Now that's my long-term vision. Some of you might look at a couple of the things on this list and be like, I kind of like that. I want that to be my vision as well. And some of you might say, no, I, there's a couple other things that I really want to do in my own long-term vision. What's important is that you create your long-term vision. And I want to give you a place to start. The place to start in creating a long-term vision for your life and yourself is a coffee stain. Let's think about a coffee stain. So like I said before, I, I live in Cleveland. And so in the wintertime in February, March, life sucks. It's just the worst. We don't see the sun at all. It gets dark at like four. Um, it's freezing cold outside. It takes 10 minutes for our cars to warm up. Life is terrible in, in Cleveland in February and March. And so a lot of people, they make plans to go somewhere warm in late February, early March, maybe April. They make plans to go to, say, Cancun. And so you spend a bunch of money, you, you get plane tickets, you get reservations to a resort. And you get on that airplane and you pull down that tray thing, you know, the, the little tray that's on the back of the seat in front of you. You pull down the tray and you see this, it's a coffee stain. It's just a coffee stain. It's on your tray. See, here's the thing about coffee stains. They're kind of gross. Like, I don't really wanna put my laptop on the tray. I just don't. I don't wanna put my book or my Kindle. I just, eh, I just don't want to. So then I wait until somebody who works for the airline walks by and they go, excuse me, can I have a napkin? And they say, yeah, yeah, here's a napkin. And, and I take the napkin, but the napkin's dry. So it doesn't really wipe off the coffee stain. I'm like, ah, I got to wait for that person to walk by again. And then I wait, wait for the person to walk by. I go, hey, can, can you give me like a wet napkin? And they're like, oh yeah, sure, sure. I'll give you a little bit of water. So I wet the napkin and then I, I wipe the coffee stain up. But now I have this stupid wet napkin. this like wet, dirty napkin. I'm like, ah, what do I do with this thing? We haven't even taken off yet. The people haven't walked by with their garbage bag. Ah. And so I like, I like, shove it like somewhere, like underneath my pant leg or something like that. Now, has that ruined my trip? Has that, has that ruined my trip to Cancun? Is my trip ruined? Does it suck now? No, it's fine. The trip to Cancun is fine. But there's this like little thing, this little grody thing that I had to deal with. 
And when I go to different dental offices, and I go to a lot, I go to, I go to probably about two dental offices a month, and I do my little motivational talk, and I get the teams all jazzed up and excited. And then we go through and we look at their offices, and I ask, what are the coffee stains? Every office has coffee stains. Every office has coffee stains. There's just something kind of gross, something grody. So I want you to take a second right now, and I want you to think about the following. What are the things in your office, the little things, the operational snafus, maybe something about the flow, the movement of people, the chores. What are the things that are creating conflict between team members, frustration, annoyance? What are the things that are creating a lack of efficiency, a lack of fun, a lack of enjoyment, or just an overall feeling of grodiness? What are the things that are just obstacles to the realization of your long-term vision. Think about that. Take a second. Think about your own office and think about one or two things. One or two things that you would classify as a coffee stain. So let me share with you a couple of mine. All right, let's see who's paying attention. So right now, there's about 25 of you on the call. I want you to, okay, so I'm doing a, a class two composite here, okay? Um, and so I'm, I'm putting a sectional matrix band. This is, um, I don't remember what it's called, a garrison or something like that. I'm putting a sectional matrix band on this tooth so that I'm, I'm separating it from the tooth next door. It's kind of the new version of a Toffelmeyer. Now, can anybody tell me what is this white stuff that's right here. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but what's the white stuff on that ring that's holding on to that tooth? What's that white stuff called? Let's see, I'll wait for somebody to type it into the chat. Yeah, Sonny, I would kind of agree. I would kind of agree, but Sonny, who's smuts? Is it this patient's smuts? Because see, it's not that gross, right? If it's the patient smuts, it's like, well, it's their own mouth. Sonny, is this the patient smuts? Anybody else have any guesses? Thank you, Sonny. This is composite and it's light cured, caked on composite that is not from this procedure. And that, everyone, is really freaking gross. That's disgusting. And I don't really want to hear about like um, spore tests or autoclaves. If that was my mouth, I would be freaking disgusted. Yet, this was a procedure in which that composite from some older patient made it into the mouth of this patient. That is a feeling of grodiness. What about this one? These are called Dentrix procedure buttons. And for those of you who have Dentrix, it's pretty simple. There, if, if you wanna do a crown on a tooth, you click the, the tooth and then you click one of these buttons and all of a sudden you've treatment planned a crown. But the problem with these buttons is that some of them are buttons that we never, for procedures we never ever use. And then there's procedures that we do all the time that we don't have buttons for. That's a huge lack of efficiency. Or what about this? You know, I'm a motivational speaker, right? This is my living. Yet in my office, we have these uh, quotes like motivational quotes in the employee lounge. Yet when I put them up, I couldn't even put them up straight. They're like all jacked up and wonky. This is like, uh, I, I could have had my, my, my 10 year old, my 11 year old son put these up and they would have been better than this. Or how about this? This is so nice, it's so cute, right? Pa picture of our hygienist smiling there with a, with a patient, looks like a military veteran. Isn't that nice? So nice. Only problem is she hasn't been working for us for like four years. This is a huge coffee stain. Imagine if you were the hygienist who's been working for me for the last three years and every time you come to work, you're like, I never even met this lady before. These are coffee stains and every single office has them. 
So here's my question. Oh, and then of course, the biggest coffee stain. And that's the fact that I have hair growing out of my ears and I have insane amounts of eyebrow length. This is a coffee stain. Why is it a coffee stain? Because it's hard to treatment plan expensive dental procedures when you look like a cartoon villain. All of these are coffee stains. So here's what I would like to challenge all of you to do. By the way, during I've been doing coffee stain assignments for my team for the past seven years. And we, I feel like we get better and better every time. However, during COVID, we did this coffee stain assignment and look in our office, I get paid to teach people how to become better. In our office, we had that many bullet points for our coffee stains. So here's your assignment right now. For the 26 of you who are, who are logged in right now, your assignment is to think of coffee stains, okay? You have to provide a list of coffee stains. They have to be specific, solution-oriented without any blaming, okay? Specific means specific. You can't write, we need better teamwork. That's not a coffee stain. That, that's so bland. Like, you, I don't even know how to fix that. You can't write, we need better teamwork. You could write something like, sterilization cassettes seem to pile up. The team needs to all commit to cleaning up instruments, even if it's not their own cassette. Now that's a coffee stain. That's solution oriented. It's specific and there's no blaming. You can't be like, well, if Carla would just step it up a little bit. No, it's no blaming. And so I know that most of the people that are on this call right now, you're, you're doctors. So in the, the handout that I'm providing to all of you, I've made it so that it's very easy for you to allow your entire team to do this coffee stain assignment as a team. So what I'd like for all of you to do now is go on that website that I asked you to go on, okay? That polleverywhere.com. I will keep that up. It's pollev.com. Let me type it here in the chat. And then we're gonna go over there and we're going to share and we're gonna share the coffee stains that you all have. All right. All right, whoever said hi, hi, hi back. So dirty floors, that's a coffee stain. Composite on instruments, oh, somebody else has got that. Okay, whoever wrote better communication skills, that's not a good coffee stain. It's too vague, it's too, all right. <laughs> Somebody talked about one of their doctors, better communication skills. So cleanliness seems to be a problem. Composite on instruments seems to be a problem. Communication skills seems to be an issue. Communication skills with patient treatment. I don't know how much of a, how good a coffee stain that is. The point of the coffee stain assignment is to share something specific, is to share something specific. Communicating with others when they have an issue. Um, whoever typed that in, that is unbelievably common. And I get hired to go speak at different dental offices. And I would say that the problem that you just shared is something that a lot of people, uh, a lot of people have problems with. And it's actually something that I'll be talking about during this lecture. So for those of you who actually um, contributed just now, that was nice, thank you. Um, though I do want, uh, for the rest of you, start thinking about the coffee stains that you have in your own office. Because the way to, et to eventually attain that extraordinary status is to actually start determining your coffee stains. So here's the problem. Here's my team, cute little team. And there's a monkey. And I'll tell you why I put a monkey there. Because on a day-to-day -day basis, as the leader of the team, as one of the bosses, my wife and I, but we both own the office together. She's a dentist also. I feel like I have a lot of monkeys on my back. A lot of monkeys, man, I got payroll and I have like clinical dentistry stuff and I got to call a lab about a case. And then, you know, if my kid is struggling in math, I got that monkey on my back. I have monkeys on my back, I just do. 
like I just do. I probably will for the next 20 years. I have monkeys on my back. And the problem with the coffee stain assignment is that if one of your team members is like, oh, I love the coffee stain assignment. Here, let me unload on you. I think we really need to start organizing the lab area so it's easy for us to communicate with the front desk about lab cases. Don't you think that that's such a good idea? And the fact is, it probably is a good idea. The problem is I already have a lot of monkeys on my back. And so when a team member, when they introduce a coffee stain, they're putting more monkeys on your back. And that's just not acceptable. You already have too many. And so as more and more team members start to introduce coffee stains, you're going to have more coffee stains on your back as a doctor. And the problem with doing that is that you're gonna do one of two things. Thing number one is you're just gonna ignore their suggestion, not because it was a bad suggestion, but because you just have too many monkeys on your back. And this is just overwhelming for you. That's number one. Thing number two is you are gonna take their suggestion, but then you're gonna execute the improvement. You, the boss, the leader. So there in that picture, there's my dental assistant, Kathy. And she comes up to me and she says, Dr. Gupta, I really think that we should organize our lab cases a little bit better because see, sometimes the front desk doesn't know if a lab case has come in and the patient is coming in, but we don't have the lab case and it's really embarrassing. But if we communicate better with the front desk, don't you think that's a great idea? And I say, yeah, Kathy, that's a great idea. I'm going to create a new system for that. And so I'm up all night on a Saturday and my kids are like, daddy, come play with me. And I'm like, can't kids, I got to fix this lab case. And I, and I create this new system. And the problem with creating the new system is when I show it to the team, it's not at all what Kathy had in mind. Nothing. Kathy's like, no, no, no I didn't, I don't want you to like create a spreadsheet or anything like that. I just, I just was hoping that you would buy some of those little, little containers so that we could color code them. That, that was it. That's the problem with taking the monkeys on your own back. That's the problem is that when you put the monkeys on your back, you execute the improvement. And when you execute the improvement, you're going to execute that improvement based on your own, based on your own vision but it's not your vision that matters here, it's Kathy's. Kathy's the one that came up with a coffee stain. Kathy's the one who's gonna have passion around that improvement. She's the one who's already created a vision towards that improvement. And so when a team member comes up to you and, and suggests a coffee stain for long-term improvement, you take the monkey and you go, thanks, thanks, Hillary. Thanks for the monkey. Ugh. I'm gonna put it right back on your shoulders. Cool? Okay, here you go, Hillary. Bye. Now, this is what you do. You tell Hillary to follow these instructions. Hillary, I really like your suggestion. I'm going to empower you to see this through. So answer the following. How are we gonna accomplish this? Who's gonna take charge? What amount of time do you need? What other resources do you need? Whose help will you need to enlist? And how will this new thing positively impact our team? And how will this new thing positively impact our patients? And you, Hillary, it's your responsibility to present this and sell this to your team members. You will be expected to present this at a future team meeting. The problem with all of this is that, I, listen, we've done these coffee stain assignments and they're good. Like, if you actually listen to this advice and you have everybody sit down and come up with actionable, implementable, specific, non-blaming, solution-oriented coffee stains, your office is going to improve. But here's the problem. You're going to go to work tomorrow and you're going to look at this schedule, you know, where before lunch you have two crowns and you got to finish endo, then you're going to place an implant, then you're going to extract and bone graft fillings, start a denture, implant impressions. In the middle of that, you have 5 billion hygiene checks. But now you have these stupid coffee stains and there's dentrix buttons that need to be updated and so you're like hey busy team members you need to fix those dentrix buttons and somebody really needs to clean out the fridge because that's a coffee stain that's freaking gross and hygienists they need to schedule their own recare oh how about that my daughter sabotaged my daughter sabotaged this uh, powerpoint awesome 
Um, hygienists should schedule their own recare. Now ignore the part that says dad is a sexy baka girl. Um, and oh, and then let's do more cute videos on Facebook. All of these suggestions are great suggestions. But the problem is, is when you try to fit them in your already busy schedule, you're gonna end up with a mutiny. Your entire team, you're gonna be like, hey, I really think we should write handwritten notes to patients. And you over there, let's compile our most commonly uh, uh, done procedures and put them on Dentrix. Your whole team is gonna be like, no, screw this. We're already busy. So here's the next rule of the coffee stain assignment. When you do the coffee stain assignment, pick one thing, vote on it as a team and make sure that it's something that as a team, you're going to attack when you return to work. Preferably that thing should be inexpensive, easy to implement and fun. You know, our office over the course of the last seven years, we've done really extraordinary things. We've done really extraordinary philanthropic things. We've upgraded the customer service that we provide to our patients in a major way. Like we, you know, if it's raining outside, somebody walks out to their car with an umbrella. We give fresh flowers to old elderly patients. We do all these cutesy little things. And they were born out of the coffee stain assignment. They were born out of our practice vision. We sat there as a team and we came up with these insane ideas that didn't even seem possible. Walking patients to their car with an umbrella, who's gonna walk them? We're all busy. Where are we gonna get these umbrellas from? It just seemed impossible. And the problem with this coffee stain assignment is that you're gonna get too many good ideas, too many things that everybody's like, wow, that's awesome. Our office would do so well if we implemented this. You have to follow the rules. Pick one and pick one that's inexpensive, easy to implement and fun. Five years ago, we decided to close our office on Veterans Day. And on Veterans Day, we made our office just open to military veterans. So any military veteran, if they wanted to come in, we would do a cleaning, we'd extract a tooth, we would do a filling for free. And that was a huge undertaking. It was enormous and it required hard work from the entire team. And I'm going to encourage anybody, even if you love this idea, don't make that something that you want to attack right away because it's too much work. It's too much expense. Make it something that you do after you've successfully implemented several easier coffee stains over, over this time. If it isn't fun, don't do it. It's not worth it. Don't do it. So, so if you noticed in the beginning, when I, when I introduced my vision, I wanted, to, I wanted something called a dream team. And a dream team, so my wife and I, we sat down, this was like 11 years ago, when our office was, our office wasn't good at all. You know, we, we, were, we were barely skimming the surface financially. We weren't doing any cool procedures. We had team members that were bullies. We had team members that were lazy. And the, the two of us sat together and we said, okay, so what would a dream team be? What is, what's our vision of a dream team? Let's describe it. And so this is what we came up with. Our dream team is a team that's consistently on time, always smiling, no bickering, problems get resolved without involving us. There's no gossiping at all, like zero, no gossiping. Complaining about one another is only constructive, no outright complaints that are hurtful. There's no more, I don't do that mentality where a hygienist is sitting next to a phone and they don't answer it because they're like, I'm a hygienist, I don't do that. Or a front desk team member can't clean a room because they're like, I'm a front desk team member, I don't clean rooms. There's no more of the, I don't do that mentality. Everyone has ownership, autonomy. Everybody feels that they're empowered to make changes and implement improvement. We go way beyond good, great customer service. Team members treat each other as equals, no matter how long somebody has been there. And everyone on the team has a genuine interest in the long-term financial health of the practice. Now, I've given this lecture enough times. I've known, I noticed a lot of people take pictures of this screen. You don't have to do anything like that. This is all laid out in your handout, okay? So for us, this was our dream team. So how are we gonna get there? And the first step to getting there was creating an atmosphere of consistent positivity, respect, and open communication. An atmosphere of consistent positivity. That's where 
there was no longer, it was no longer acceptable for people to come into work all, huh, oh, hey, how are you doing, Clara? Huh, well, I'm just, I, the bus was late to pick up my, my son and uh, there was so much traffic. There's just none of that. Everybody's just happy. They, they, even if they're not happy, they're just faking that they're happy. That's what we wanted. An atmosphere of consistent positivity, respect, and open communication. And what I realized is a lot of that starts with me. So here's where I ask you to pay attention again, all right? So for those of you who are like folding laundry right now and like maybe you have an earbud in, but you're not really paying attention, you're just here for the CE. I'm gonna ask you to pay attention right now. Harvard Business Review handed out a survey to literally thousands of people throughout the greater Boston area. Many of those people were employees. That means that they worked for a company. And they said, what do you think, what, I'm sorry, not what do you think, what is the most valuable thing for you at your work? What do you most value at your work? So a bunch of employees, they wrote down, they, they, they ranked what they value the most. And then a bunch of employers were asked, not the same question, they were asked to guess what their employees wrote. So a bunch of employers, meaning uh, supervisors, middle managers, uh, CEOs, owners, bosses, they were asked to guess, okay, what do you think your employees wrote? So here's where I'm going to ask you, what do you think your employees at your dental office value the most? What do you think they value the most? Is it interesting work? Full appreciation of work done, competitive wages, feeling in on things, good working conditions, or opportunity for growth. Go ahead, type it in. So Frederick, Frederick wrote, wrote full appreciation of work done. Sue, appreciation. Come on, I want a couple more. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. I think it's Zigintas, Kathy, Shweta, Sue, Frederick. And actually, most of you are right. Employers in this Harvard Business Review study, they believed actually that employees wanted money, that that was the most important thing. And so Heidi, even though, um, Heidi, even though you wrote good, um, full appreciation, you also talked about money. However, employees, what they most value is appreciation, okay? is appreciation. And actually feeling in on things was number two, not competitive wages. Competitive wages is still important. It's number three, people need money. But feeling appreciated is most important. And what I think is interesting about that is that, I mean, those of you who are still listening to me, you can kind of tell I'm like a, I'm a relatively friendly, relatively gregarious individual. I'm generally pretty nice to people, but here's my problem. I'm nice generally to the people that I like to hang out with. And I have certain people who work in my office who I just think they're kind of funny and cool. And I, and I like, I, and they, they think my jokes are funny and I think they're funny. I just hang out with them more often. That's just natural. And so those people are going to feel appreciated by me much more than the people in my office who are wonderful employees, but I don't hang out with them as much. I just don't. They, they, their personalities and mine just, just are not as compatible, even though they're wonderful employees. So I got a game for you. Here it is. This is what you do. You create a, a spreadsheet. And on this spreadsheet, you have everybody's name going across the x-axis. And then if you're open four days a week, Monday through Thursday or whatever, you have going down the y-axis, the days of the week. And your responsibility is to do two things. Number one is make sure that every single day you say something nice to someone. So that means next to day one, there's gotta be an X. That's responsibility number one. Responsibility number two is that at the end of the week, every single person on your team gets an X. So I swing by my hygienist office or hygienist operatory 
And I go, you know, Mindy, I, I overheard you talking to that patient and she seemed like she didn't want to have anything to do with scaling and root planing. And I don't know what you said, but like she was all on board after you talked to her. Like you're really getting good at that. And Mindy's like, yeah, yeah, no, I've been working on it. I'm like, yeah, you, you're good. Great. And Mindy kind of looks at me awkwardly and I kind of look at her awkwardly. And then I run over to my office and I give myself an X. And then later in the day, I'm like, Amber, you took a really nice photo. You're using our, our photography and that's really, really helping with these new patient consults and, and with these uh, emergency patients. And I know you are intimidated by that camera, but you're taking awesome photos now. And then I run and give myself an X. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're like, yo, Gupta, you're a big old faker. I thought you were cool, but I hate you now because you're a faker, man. You're a faker. You you don't bring it 100. And I get that. I know this is kind of fake, right? If you're forcing yourself to be nice, then you're being fake, right? But here's the crazy thing about doing this assignment. So I made sure I did it. I was very, very um, disciplined about doing this assignment. I had this little spreadsheet and I had my little X's. I still have it. And what I thought was interesting was in the beginning, I really was forcing myself to compliment people, really forcing myself. I, and I sounded awkward and I sounded fake and it just didn't seem right. But then a weird thing happened. As time went on, I just got better. It was like whatever part of my brain is responsible for noticing when somebody does something good and whatever other part of my brain that's responsible for articulating that, those parts of my brain just got bigger. There was like, it was like shooting free throws. I was just getting better at that particular thing. And I realized this is, this is something about human nature. If we commit to something, we get better at it. Like for example, if I told every single one of you to wake up tomorrow morning, open up a bag of Cheetos and eat the whole bag of Cheetos, you would at first be like, man, this, eh, I don't know, I don't really like the taste. My fingers are all yellow. And over time, your, your physiology will change. You'll start to like look for sales on Cheetos. You'll start to like become friends with other Cheetos eaters. You'll just become more of a Cheetos type. It'll be part of your identity because you committed to it. And then if we, if we instead substitute, every day you're gonna wake up in the morning and you're gonna eat green leafy vegetables. Well, at first you're gonna be like, I don't really like the taste of this, it's weird, it's some stupid thing that Gupta made me do. And then over time, it's gonna change your identity. You wake up and commit every single day to eating green leafy vegetables, you're just going to be a, like a healthier person. Your physiology is going to change. Your taste buds are going to change. The little bacteria that live in your stomach, those are going to change. And so if you commit to something like this, where you truly say, all right, every day, I'm just going to say something nice. I'm going to say it to someone. And I'm going to make sure that there's nobody on my team that's going to get ignored here. It's going to change who you are. That little part of your brain, that, that part of your psychology, your physiology, it's going to change. And you're going to become somebody who notices more and is better at articulating these things. You know, when I go to different uh, practices and I, and I give people examples of compliments, they're like, dude, that sounds so natural from you. And it's not like I was born with that. I wasn't born with that at all. I'm like a super flawed individual, but I made this a regular part of my practice and I'm pretty good at it now. And the more important thing is the team understands that I'm grateful for them. And when you have a team that knows that you're grateful towards them, they're going to be more grateful towards you. So now you've done a lot of stuff. You've done your coffee stain assignment. You've started to create your own personal and practice vision. You've started to, um, you, you've created your own spreadsheet where you compliment people. Here's where I have to ask you about these guys. Um, all right, let's see. Who's the first person to tell me? Who's the guy in a suit? Who's the guy wearing the suit? There we go. You spelled it wrong, Sonny, but it's Pat Riley. Um, one L. All right, somebody other than Sonny, who is the guy, who's the guy number 32, who's on your right, who's on Pat Riley's left? 
Who's the guy? Number 32. I think it's Zaginthus, but I don't know. I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but nice job. Okay. All right. One more. Who is the really tall guy? Number 33. Who's on Pat Riley's left or Pat Riley's right. Who's got the goggles over his head. Who is that guy? All right. Zaginthus. Really, really bad spelling, but you were right. That's Kareem. So here's the thing. Even for those people who are not basketball, there are people who are listening right now who are like, dude, I don't know anything about basketball. Don't care about basketball. I, I don't know. Okay, here we go, Heidi. Have you heard those names before? Have you heard the name Magic Johnson or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Now, obviously, Heidi, you don't care about basketball. You don't even know what sport this is. But have you heard those names before? Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Have you heard those names? I'll wait. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or you were kidding. Here's the thing. Everybody's heard those names. And that's because they were so freaking good. They were amazing. They were like the most talented basketball team ever. They were incredible. Their worst player would have been an all-star. He would have been the best player on any other team. And they underperformed. This incredibly extraordinary team, they underperformed. In their first, I'm sorry, they underperformed in their first playoff appearance. They did great later. But in their first playoff appearance, they, they, they lost in the first round of the playoffs. And Pat Riley, what he did the summer between that early exit from the playoffs and the next season was he, did, he had all of the players get together and determine their unique personal barriers. He asked all of them to identify what is it about you that sucks? All of you have it and your entire team has it. So assignment number two is identifying your own personal unique barriers. Some of you have a hard time getting in on time, have a hard time being punctual. Some of you love to gossip. Some of you have a bad temper and that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's part of being human. It's the cost of living. We are all imperfect. But what's so nice about doing this assignment is that we give ourselves the chance to take our vulnerability and put it out there in front of our team. So let me give you an example. This is me. Ready? Here's me. When I get frustrated, I get really quiet. The person that I'm frustrated with knows that I'm frustrated because they're like, oh, what happened? Gupta is not talking anymore. Gupta looks all weird and he's got these crinkles in his face. He must be frustrated, but they're not sure why they're fr that I'm frustrated, nor do they even know that I'm frustrated with them because all I did was get really, really quiet. But I expect them to know why. And the fact that they don't know why makes me even more frustrated. So now frustrated, I ask them to hand me the air water syringe and they hand me the air water syringe, but I grab it all aggressively because I'm pissed. And they're thinking, I hate working for the guy. I don't even know why he's mad. I don't even know if he's mad at me. Why did he have to grab the air water syringe like that? This is a unique personal barrier. I am making it more difficult to be around me. I'm making it more difficult for, for, for the, the members of my team. That's a unique personal barrier. Then... After identifying your unique personal barriers, what is it about you that sucks? The next step is to identify a doable solution. So that is something that sucks about me. And I would say that anybody who knows me well knows that about me. When I'm pissed, I'm quiet. My kids know it. My, my wife knows it. My entire team, they know it. But, but when I'm quiet, they're all wondering like, dude, we'd like to help you, but we have no idea why you're pissed or who you're pissed at. We don't, all we're going to do is just deal with you looking pissed. That's a really, that's a personal barrier of mine. And I make it more difficult for us to realize our vision. Our vision is for us to come to work and leave work happy, frustrated, not overwhelmed. And it's not easy when the boss is walking around with this crinkly face. So now we have to identify a doable solution. So here are the doable solutions that we identified as a team when we did our unique personal barrier exercise. Won't look at phone during lunch. Instead, sit with the team and make conversation. 
Number two, walk a patient out to their car, especially if they could use some help. Number three, do the garbage, change the toilet paper or some other chore, even when it's not my turn. Number four, just once a week, write a thank you note to someone. Just literally write something on a, on a card or something to a patient or a team member. The next time I feel like gossiping, I won't. The next time I feel frustrated with someone, I'll speak about it immediately and directly to that person. That was mine. That was my contribution. This next person wrote, I'll go for a walk during lunch. And then one person wrote something I thought was very unique. And that was that it wasn't a unique personal barrier that she felt was appropriate for the practice. It was a unique personal barrier that made her feel that made her feel like she didn't have control over her life. And this particular employee of mine, she says that she said that when she wakes up in the morning, she scrolls social media and that before she goes to bed, she scrolls social media and she knows that it's having an impact on how pleasant she is. She knows how it has an impact on her quality of sleep and she knows how it has an impact on the quality of a person she's becoming. And so she says, when I wake up, the first thing I do is something good, walk, meditate, plank, eat veggies, whatever. By identifying your own unique personal barriers and then identifying a, a doable solution, your practice, your team is gonna get a, a step closer to extraordinary. So many teams are unwilling to take on the vulnerability of saying, I'm pretty good, I'm a pretty good person, but here's the thing about me that sucks. And here's the thing that I most want to work on. See, Magic Johnson, Kareem, they could have just worked on the stuff they were already good at. It's fun to work on stuff we're already good at. But to work on stuff that's hard, that's something that's not in our nature, that's hard. But that's where real growth occurs. And so do it. Assignment number two, identify your own unique personal barriers and then identify a doable solution. And this should be done as a team. So what did we do with that? We made it into a game. And so if you walk into our employee lounge, it's totally messy and crappy and like carpet's old and gross. Um, but if you look there under the, uh, at the bottom of that whiteboard, you see a board that says Team Awesome. And on our Team Awesome, we decided to make a game. And that was where all of us were challenged to work on our own unique personal barriers, along with a bunch of other fun stuff. And then if we accomplished some of those unique personal barriers, we got a check mark. And those things were just like the things that I mentioned earlier. If you walk a patient out to your car, to their car, if you write a thank you note to somebody, if you learn how to do something at the practice that you didn't already know. In our office, we have a CT, we have a, um, a, a digital scanner, we have a bunch of stuff that, a, 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 an eye special uh, camera, we have a lot of stuff that you know, that, that are really beneficial if everybody knows how to do them, but some people are just not comfortable. And so we made that as one of our Team Awesome challenges. Another Team Awesome challenge was just go for a walk during lunch or play a game with the team uh, at lunch, like charades or Jeopardy or something like that. And if we got over a hundred uh, little check marks, I, we would buy everybody candles. If we got over 250, we would buy everybody yoga mats and Fitbits. And if we got over 400 as a team, we would all go and get manicures and pedicures. And that's something that we did in July of last year and we're doing currently. Now, I got a question for all of you. If it's so awesome and so amazing and the team loves it and everybody's like all jazzed up when we do it, why don't we always do Team Awesome Months? Why don't we always do Team Awesome Months? Why did we only do it in July of last year and October of this year? Mayra, we, um, everybody is responsible for uh, contributing to it at the morning huddle. So at the morning huddle, I usually grab the, the board and I say, all right, all right, who, who gets credit for, you know, whatever the challenge was for the week. And so it's completely based on honesty. And if some jerk off wants to give themselves credit, even though they didn't deserve it, they're probably somebody who eventually is not going to be a good fit for our team. So why don't we do this? So, so why don't we do this all the time? Why isn't this done every month? Why is it only done one month out of the year? It, I mean, if it's so great, if, 
if Gupta is up here telling you all how amazing it is, why don't we do it all year? Come on, I'm gonna ask you, Sonny, you've been contributing this whole time. Why don't we do it all year? You got it, it loses its flavor. It's great, you do it for a month, everybody's jazzed up, it's fun, you play Jeopardy at lunchtime, you do all of this fun stuff, and then enjoy your pedicure and let everybody kind of get back to the status quo. I realize this, as humans, we're humans and we go back to being humans. And that's why it's so motivating about once a year when we get back to doing something that's gonna sharpen all of our edges. It's a really wonderful feeling. And so for those of you who are constantly challenging your team, yo, take a step back, chill out. Notice when the wheel is starting to get really dull. And those are the times where you want to introduce a new game, a new team awesome, a new blitz, whatever you would call it. Don't allow things to just constantly challenge because it loses its impact. We have to remember that humans are humans. Now, I just talked to you about all of this kumbaya, like, oh man, Gupta, you must have the most awesome office and everybody loves each other so much. Like you guys all probably just hug and like, you love each other so much. Here's what I'll tell you. I have two kids. And one of them in September of last year pushed the other one off a cliff. It wasn't a huge cliff, but he still did it. And she broke her foot. And then the other one, a couple months later, scratched him so bad that he has like this scar on his, uh, uh, under his eye. Like she literally like, like Wolverined his eyeball and he got that big old scar. I can't say that I'm some master at motivating people to never fight. Because if I said that, I'd be the biggest hypocrite in the world. My two kids, they fight regularly. That's the problem with being human. Humans are not always perfectly compatible. But as a team leader, as a boss in your office, there's a lot of things that you can do to minimize some of the conflict that can occur in your office. So let's take, look at this picture. It's so cute, right? It's so cute and nice, right? They must, they must really love each other, all of them, because they're all wearing purple and their, their color, you know, they have the accents and their smile. Well, they don't totally, they're not totally perfect. You know, Lauren, she's not always on time. And Hillary, even though we have a mouthwatch camera and an eye special camera, she's like intimidated by the technology. So she never takes photos. And then Laura, for some reason, we don't know why, but she's like mad at her, at Mindy, but we don't know why. She, we just know that she's mad at her because they like get all weird and awkward. And then she doesn't help with sterilization and pisses everybody off. And Allison loves to gossip. And Mindy, when she's in a bad mood, it's so noticeable. Like her face is all red and like crinkly and stuff. And Amber, she knows how to do all this weird stuff. So if she's like gone, nobody knows how to do it. Like, like when our server goes down, like when the, 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 uh, the server at the office, when we're like, oh, no, our computer's giving me problems. She's like, don't worry, everyone. I'll fix it. And so she fixes it and she does magic. And then everything, all of a sudden the server's working. We're like, oh, thank goodness for Amber. But then when she's gone, like the whole office goes up in flame. And then, of course, there's Kathy, who's been my assistant for ever since we opened back in the early 2000s. And of course, because she's been working so long, the rules don't apply. And then of course, there's me, who's moody, who's not always like this happy, gregarious person. And of course, because my wife often attends these lectures and I don't wanna get in any trouble, we do have one member of the office that just doesn't have any unique personal barriers. So what do you do if you have this office? This is a, this is a, not perfect office. This is trouble. And the reason it's trouble because resentment and frustration and conflict are always around the corner. Always. Resentment, conflict, frustration, always around the corner. Because every single person here, they have their own unique personal barrier. 
and it's getting frustrating for the rest of the team. So what creates that resentment? It's only three things, unclear expectations, unmet expectations, and a lack of accountability. Now, I want you to look at that list and tell me which of those is your employee's responsibility. So you have a dental assistant and your dental assistant isn't doing their job very well. Are they doing their job? Are they not doing their job well because they have unclear expectations? Are they not doing their job because they're just not meeting their expectations? Or are they not doing their job because they, there's no accountability for the fact that they're not doing their job well? And the sad reality is when you have a team member that's not doing their job well, it's probably your fault. Sorry. Because unclear expectations and a lack of accountability, that's on you. That's on the boss. So we had this uh, dental assistant, her name was Karen, and she was uh, pretty good. She was okay. She was a pretty good dental assistant. She'd suction good, retract well, made nice temps. She'd never take out the garbage. And like taking out the garbage is not something that I do. So, you know, I'll finish up with my day at work and I'll say bye to everyone and I'll put it on my backpack and then I just leave. And when I come back the next day, the garbage is gone. That's just how it's been working for the last almost 20 years. So that's just how it's been working. And then all of a sudden I come back, I come to work the next day and I, and I open the back door and I'm like, oh, weird, the garbage is still there. That's weird. And then I just went to, did my work. And at the end of the day, there was more garbage. It was like two days worth of garbage. And I'm like, man, that's a lot of garbage, but I didn't really care. So I went home and then I come back third day, the garbage is still there. So I get Kathy. Kathy's the one who's been working with me for so long. And I'm like, Kathy, what's the deal? How come there's so much garbage? And Kathy goes, oh, I've been waiting for you to ask. I'm so excited to tell you. And I'm like, ooh, Kathy, tell me, tell me what's happening. And Kathy goes, you know, Karen, Karen, you know, the new assistant, she doesn't take the garbage out. And I'm like, okay. And she goes, so we decided, the rest of us, we decided we're not going to take the garbage out to see if Karen notices that the garbage is accumulating and then she'll feel bad and then she'll take the garbage out. So here's where I ask you all to go on pollev.com, this survey, pollev.com, Ankur Gupta 701. Okay, go on the survey here. Let's see, let me see if I can rush over there. Okay, so here's where you go on that survey and let's see anonymously, whose fault was this? Kathy, the assistant who told on Karen, Karen, the assistant who never took out the trash or somebody else. Sorry, I just activated it. Let's see what people have to say. Whose fault was this? Kathy, Karen, or someone else? Kathy's the assistant who's been working for a long time. Okay, okay. Just looks like some people say someone else. Zigintas, she says someone else. Somebody said Kathy. Come on, everyone, humor me. Like go on the go on the the polleverywhere.com. Just click on it, click on it from my um from the chat and enter either A, B, or C. All right. 67, okay, so it looks like only three people. Zagintas, Frederick, Heidi, C, more and more people saying C. And who is that someone else? Who is that someone else? Seems like more people are answering C. That someone else is me. And this is the reason why, because Karen, when she was when she was accepted for the job, when we hired her, we said, Karen, we're hiring you to become a dental assistant. And she's like, okay, cool. What does a dental assistant do? And we said, well, the dental assistant sterilizes instruments, 
sets up rooms, sterile um, suctions for the doctor, makes temporaries, retracts. That's what a dental assistant does. And Karen's like, great, I can do all those things. And she did. She did all of those things. What this was a case of was unclear expectations. And so your next assignment, okay, so you have the coffee stain assignment, the unique personal barriers assignment, and then here comes assignment number three, creating a job description. And this is where everyone on your team takes a piece of paper and they write down everything that they do, everything that they do, but they can't write down the obvious stuff. They're just not allowed, no obvious stuff. You can't, if your hygienist writes, I copiously remove a buildup of tartar and calculus on the subgingival surface. Uh, don't, they don't have to write that crap. I, you don't have to write obvious stuff. The whole purpose of a job description is to identify the not obvious stuff. Identify the things that don't get done consistently or the things that, that get done, but they get done by somebody who's resentful. So this is how you create a job description. Take a sheet of paper, and then write down everything that you do when you get to the office, how you prepare for the huddle, how you close up the office, when you have downtime, weekly maintenance, monthly maintenance that you do. And upon completing the above list, indicate when you generally have time to do it, how often you do it, and who else knows how to do it. You know that example that I used earlier about Amber? So she, whenever we have, would have computer problems, she would be like, don't worry, everyone, I got this. And she would go back to the like closet room thing that has the server. She would spend a couple of minutes there and then she would come out. And the, all of a sudden the computers would all work. And then we did this job description assignment. We're like, Amber, let's, let's have you train a couple other people. How do you do that? Like, what do you do? How do you like, do you like configure the IP address? You know, 601.80. She's like, yeah, no, 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 I I'll show you. So, so we have our little clipboards. And we're like, okay, Amber, show us. And she unplugged the stupid thing, waited 10 seconds and plugged it back in. That's all she did. She unplugged it and waited and then plugged it back in. That was the thing that only Amber could do for like six years in our practice. There are things that certain people know how to do. And for some reason, until you do the job description, the assignment, they're the only ones who know how to do, even though it's tremendously easy for them to train a handful of other team members. And so this assignment right here becomes extremely valuable. And remember the most important part, it never includes obvious stuff. Just what stuff that doesn't get con done consistently and the rule is don't blame, no blaming, just no saying, well, I clean out the fridge because Carla always leaves her yogurt in there. You don't have to do this in the job description. Just say you clean out the fridge and how often you do it. And so the boss can have an opportunity to delegate that particular responsibility. Who's cleaning out the fridge? Who's taking out the trash? On which days? Who's turning on the radio? Who's wiping cobwebs from the corners? Who's flushing the water lines? How often? Who's unlocking the outside door? Who's putting salt on the parking lot? Who's replacing the paper to towels and the toilet paper? And when and how often do you do it? The job description assignment is a really, really nice way for you to eliminate that potential of creating some of that conflict amongst your team members. And now an even greater source of conflict between team members, and that's downtime. Let me see if I have a pen in here. I don't, darn it. Okay, downtime. That's where your patient no-showed or your patient canceled, or you had an hour to seat that crown, but it just whoop, sat right in, just bloop, no adjusting anything. It was perfect. Bit down, oh, it feels perfect. Margins, contact, everything's perfect. And you just stuck some cement on there, bloop, put that on. And it took five minutes instead of 40 minutes. That's downtime. So what can you do during downtime? Well, you, you can do some lab work or you can stock your room or stock 
the operatories are stuck, the, the main area, you can go to sterilization and make sure that it's caught up. You can go up and down the hallway and say, hey, yo, it's me. I have a couple minutes. My patient no showed. Does anybody need any help? You can tidy up. You can do ordering and inventory. You can check to see if anybody needs help charting. You can even look at your phone, but make it seem like you're doing something important. You're like, just, just texting a patient, making sure they're, they're uh, feeling okay after the surgery. Just, you know, just texting. I'm just che checking our practice Facebook account, making sure there's no messages. So you can do all of those things. The problem is those things create a tremendous amount of resentment. And this is why. Um, hygienist, I'll take Mindy. This is Mindy. My hygienist, okay? One of my hygienists. And this is Jazz, my dental assistant, okay? Jazz just got a ton of downtime because our patient no-showed. Mindy is stressed out. Mindy is going way too long on her hygiene appointment. And she knows she's not going to finish that hygiene appointment on time. And the next patient is already here. Mindy is stressed out. And she's like, oh no, I'm stressed out. Jazz is like, sweet, I have downtime. I'm gonna go to the back. We have stacks of UPS and FedEx boxes. I'm gonna open those up and I'm gonna stock some of our supplies and inventory. So Jazz, she goes off and she does something that she feels is important. Mindy, She's stressed out and she spent the whole morning stressed out. She's been running behind. And so at lunchtime, Jazz is like, hey, Mindy, how was your day? And Mindy's like, it was horrible. I was stressed out. I was running behind. You know that lady, Margaret, she took way too long. And Jazz is like, oh, man, my day was great. I was able to catch up on a bunch of inventory because Dr. Gupta's uh, uh, appointment canceled. And Mindy's now like, wait, what did you say? And Jazz is like, yeah, I got caught up. And Mindy's like, you could have, you could have brought my patient back. You could have taken the bite wings. You, you could have helped me out. And Jazz is like, well, listen, it's not like I was sitting in the parking lot reading the newspaper and smoking crack. I was doing something important. And Mindy's like, yeah, but you could have helped me. And then they fight. And then I'm like screwed because I'm the boss. And they're like, Gupta, you need to have a talk with Jazz. She's being doesn't even know our priorities. And then, you know, because I'm a weenie, I don't know how to have that talk with jazz. So here's what I'm going to suggest to all of you. It's called the downtime checklist. Here's how it goes. This is where when you have downtime, you list the things that a person must do in order. So the very first thing a person must do if they have downtime is walk up and down the hallway and be like, hey, I have some downtime. Does anybody need help? And they're in their head. They're like, please say no. Please say no. I really don't want to help you. And then no, no, nobody. No, no, nobody needs help. Okay. That's one. Then number two, check the sterilization area and make sure that there's not cassettes that are stacking up. So they go into sterilization. Please don't have cassettes stacked up. And they look in there and there's no, there's no cassettes. They're like, yes. Then number three is check to see if there's any ops that are dirty and if they can help turn them over. In our office, that's numbers one, two, and three. And to be quite honest, we don't have a four, five, six, or a seven. We don't. You can do whatever you want. After you satisfy one, two, and three in our office, you can do lab work. You can stock your operatory. You can make goodie bags. You can do whatever you want. You can go out, read the newspaper, smoke crack. I don't care. As long as you do one, two, and three, it's good. And what we've realized is that by having the downtime checklist, making sure that the entire team understands their expectations during downtime, it has made work much more enjoyable and less contentious. And so it's something that I really recommend all of you try to do, okay? Downtime checklist, it's easy. The other thing that we do is we have a uh, weekly, a monthly, and a every six maintenance log. And this has actually been pretty helpful. I, I included it in your handout. This has been pretty helpful so that some of the things that need to be done on a 
regular basis, but not on a super regular basis, we have some system of accountability for those things. There's something, um, there's this test that we need to do. Our, our water doesn't come from the bottle. Our water comes from like a water line. And so there's this test that we have to do where we have to spray water at like a Petri dish looking thing to make sure that our water doesn't have bacteria on it. And it sucks. It takes like a long time. And, and then we have to have proof that there's no bacteria in our water. And then we have to flush all of our lines with like bleachy water. It's a long process. It takes about an hour. And so we do that once every six months. And the pr fact is, if we didn't have this little weekly, monthly, every six month checklist thing, that that thing could get forgotten. And it could be a year or nine months or something like that before we can do this. The second reason why I think that this is really important is because we have been audited by OSHA. Um, apparently it was a random audit, but we were audited by OSHA and it was awesome. It was awesome because we showed them this thing and they were like, whoa, we've never seen an office that has that. That's amazing. And they like, flew through the office and they and they were really happy with us. And so having something like this is really nice in case that there's some regulatory audit that ever happens to happen happens to happen in your office. And then there's daily chores. Another the last of the three main sources of conflict amongst team members. And see in our office every day there's certain chores that need to be done. Now, it's already 8:30 so at least in the eastern now, all of you are from Texas. Wait, let me go up to here. Oh, no, there's a guy from New York. L. Okay. So the one person from New York, I don't know if you're still paying attention. But for those of you from the earlier time zones, it's not that late. I want you to guess. So these are the daily chores. These are in my office. Everybody has to do. Every one of these chores has to be done. I want you to guess which is the one that sucks the most. So Sunny, oh Sunny, you're trying to keep an eye on the bills also. Sunny bathroom, actually no, it's a, it should be the bathroom. But no, Mayra, I, I think it's Myra, but it could be Mayra. May, Myra, you're correct. It's laundry. Laundry's the one nobody wants to do, and I think it's because it takes the longest. It takes long. We have a laundry machine in our office. All of our scrubs go in the laundry machine. All of our clinic coats go in the laundry machine. Um, we have like this weird waterproof thing that we bought after COVID. Um, those all have to get la laundered. The, the head cap thing that we now wear after COVID, that gets laundered. Everybody on the team hates doing laundry. And so what we first did, everybody on the team hates doing laundry and everybody wants to do the wiping handle switches and knobs. That's another COVID born uh, daily chore where somebody just has to wipe. Like, see patients, see, we're wiping our doorknobs, see. I guess that's a really easy task. What we did at first was we did a chore jar. And I'm gonna recommend that none of you do a chore jar. And the reason I'm gonna make that recommendation is because if you're the hygienist who picks laundry three days in a row, you're gonna to wanna to punch somebody in the face. So don't do a chore jar. Instead, I would recommend making a schedule in which every chore is rotated. So in my office, we have 13 employees, okay? So that means that if you do the laundry on Monday the 1st of a month, you're not gonna have to do laundry again until 13 more working days go by. And that has been really fair. And it's something where this, which created a little bit of tension when we first started monitoring our daily chores, this has actually eliminated all of that tension where every single person on the team knows, oh, Okay, on Tuesday, April 28th, I'm the person in charge of the break room. And on the 29th, I'm in charge of the bathrooms, etc. And it's actually very easy. Actually, the web has really easy ways that that auto populate these responsibilities. It's called um uh it's called like a chore delegator or something like that where you enter everybody's names and you enter in all the chores and it just brrr, it just populates it and then you print it out. And that's that's been actually really helpful for us, okay? I wanna end by talking about just a couple things. Um, well, actually just by a show of hands. So for the, let's see, are there still 26 of you? I think there has to be because you want the CE. Oh, there's 28 of you, all right. Um, 
just by a show of hands, how many of you have team meetings, regular monthly team meetings or weekly team meetings or whatever it is? And that doesn't include um, that doesn't include morning huddles. How many of you have actual team meetings? So Myra, every two weeks, that's awesome. Actually, Myra, I'm I'm curious to know if you don't mind, um, email me afterwards. I'm curious to know how your office is able to effectively pull that off because I think we would benefit from having more than once a month team meetings, um, but we haven't been able to do this. Frederick, once per week, dang, okay. Frederick, uh, how long are your once a week team meetings? Shad, so same with me. I have once a month, Jason once a month. Um, Heidi, I think you said no, you don't. Um, so I'm going to really, really strongly suggest team meetings. Um, Sunny, your meetings are are down are broken down with departments. Sunny, would you mind just writing uh, typing in how many team members you have? Um, so Frederick, your team meetings are one hour. I see. Oh, wow. Okay, Sunny. That's a big office. Okay, I'm assuming your multi-location office. Um, okay, so Zigintas and um, Frederick, you know, I would love to start a dialogue with you about the one hour once a week team meeting. We have a four hour once a month team meeting. And I wonder, I wonder if a one hour once a week team meeting might be more effective. Um, let me tell you why I think team meetings are so important and why Heidi, I, I, I don't know if Heidi, if you're the boss or if you are a, an employee, but if you're the boss, I'm going to strongly suggest team meetings. Um, like I said earlier, we've, you know, my office is far from perfect, but we've done really extraordinary things. Um, especially in, in terms of philanthropic, um, philanthropic events. Um, in terms of team outings and team challenges, and in terms of creating extraordinary customer service, we're, we've done awesome stuff. And it's not because we came up with good ideas. That's just, that's not how you, that's not how you execute or implement um, amazing improvements. It's not, it, ideas are fine. It's through meeting and planning. That's how these things are created. And so our team meetings, are always constitute uh, the following six things. Um, any major office improvement, that would be the coffee stain assignment. Any major office project, which is also the coffee stain assignment, but it goes past that and it incorporates your vision for the perfect, most extraordinary office. Account accountability for responsibilities. This is where things like the downtime checklist, the, um, the uh, the job descriptions, the chores, that's where those things get discussed and properly solidified. Philanthropy, you know, I'm assuming Sunny with a with an office like yours, there is there's a lot of disposable income there. And um, you probably have the you probably already do, but probably have the potential to do major philanthropic things with the resources that you have. Um, you know, with uh, the fact that you're out of several locations, et cetera. All of us, every single one of you, even the poorest person on this call, the poorest person out of the 27 people that are on this call, all of you have the opportunity to do some philanthropy, to offer a scholarship at the high school, to do some type of free dental um, type of work. And then of course there's scripting and rehearsal, which I'll get into in a second and fun. If your office, can manage to make those a focus on a regular basis, once a month, for some of you, once a week, where you hit on all of these six things, you're going to achieve extraordinary. And that's just a fact. So, you know, uh, what we've done is we've broken up our team meetings where, where one team meeting throughout the month, I mean, one month throughout the year is focused on a particular responsibility, okay? So for example, um, month one is where everybody actually shares their personal vision for their life and their vision for the practice, their vision for the perfect practice. Month two, we always do a coffee stain assignment once a year. 
month three personal best practices that's a lot that's that's the um that's where we become better people by being vulnerable about our own limitations month four is money day where we talk about um what we're spending money on how to achieve a bonus etc philanthropy day is month five now if you notice month five is philanthropy day that is may even though our big philanthropic event is Veterans Day in November. And that's because that takes so much freaking planning that we have to start five, six months in advance. Month six, extra, extraordinary customer service. Seven, internal marketing musts. Eight, new patient experience. Nine, personal goal setting. 10 is dental equipment day. That's where we talk about, okay, what is the, what's the dream equipment? You know, we have isolates in every off in every op now. We have mouthwatches in every op. Um, that that was born out of dental equipment day. You don't want just the boss to be the one to decide what dental equipment. Give your team the opportunity to say, "Yo, I would love to have this type of thing to make practice a little bit easier." And of course, month twelve is fun, and and I'll talk a little bit about fun in a second. Um, scripting and rehearsal. At every team meeting, it's important to give yourselves the opportunity to pretend you're a patient and give somebody like Amber an opportunity to practice uncomfortable conversations. My practice, we're not part of the MetLife PPO. So at our team meeting, I say, Amber, I want you to answer the phone. Ready? Ring, 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 ring. And she says, hi, thank you for calling North Ridgeville Family Dentistry. This is Amber. How can I help you? And I say, hey, do you take MetLife? Now Amber's faced with the decision. We're not part of MetLife's PPO. How does Amber answer that question? How does Alyssa, who also works at the front desk, how does Carly? And the problem is if you don't do scripting at your team meetings, you might realize that all three of them answer that question a different way. And that's not acceptable. Your patients should not get a different experience based on who answers the phone, okay? Or we take an emergency consult and take a dental assistant and say, hey, all right, you have an emergency that comes in, you take the eye special camera, you take a photo, and, uh, and now it's time to chat with the patient. What do you say? How do you bring up their dental long-term goals? How do you bring up how they feel about their teeth and how do you create an emotional connection with that patient? And what we have found is some of our dental assistants they're naturally very good at this. And some of our dental assistants naturally really struggle. And if we don't have regular team meetings, we're just never going to get good. And then, of course, at our team meeting, we have Lauren sit down with one of us and we say the work. And Lauren says the work that uh, Dr. Gupta recommends will cost you $5,000 after insurance. And then me, as the pretend patient, I'm like, whoa, $5,000, you're kidding no way. I was expecting it to cost a couple hundred dollars. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to think about this. And Lauren has to know how to remain confident, no matter how a patient is going to react. And that doesn't happen with, with Lauren's um, natural given traits and tendencies. It happens with practice. And I can't think of another time to practice scenarios like this than at a team meeting. I talked about a lot of stuff and I gave you a ton of assignments. You know, my hope is that, um, is that you do one of these, you do something. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of really good offices um, that are doing a lot of really good things, but I'll tell you, I think my office is good. And I think that we do a lot of good things yet. Every year when we repeat these same assignments, we just get a ton of new stuff, a ton of new opportunities to get better, to grow, to, to implement new changes as a team. And so no matter how well you're doing, there's always a bucket that's empty. And I, I want you to think about buckets and just think about that deathbed again. And if you look at the quality of your life, the quality of your life personally, the quality of your practice, it's just a bunch of buckets. There's just buckets everywhere, There's a big room full of buckets. And some of these buckets are big. And these big buckets are buckets that you really value. So you can have a bucket for money 
and a bucket for the quality of your sleep and a bucket for back pain and a bucket for your personal inner peace. And then there's the relationship. There's the, all the buckets that, that um, define your different relationships. And some of these buckets are big. So for the, for example, my bucket that, that is about my, my relationship with my kids, it's a big bucket. It's something that I really, really take personally. And I really want it to be a valuable full bucket in my life. And then there's this little tiny bucket in my room that's, that has to do with curb appeal and, and, a, and a green lawn. But all of us have a bunch of buckets, a philanthropy bucket, a, a friendship bucket, all of that kind of stuff, just buckets and buckets. And the problem with having a bunch of buckets is that a lot of us, we never take the time to determine what are the big buckets and what are the small ones? And what's even worse is that all of these buckets, they have a hole at the bottom. See, when you do something good, what you're doing is you're filling your bucket. You're taking a shovel and you're filling the bucket. And the problem is, is these buckets, they have holes in them. If we don't keep those buckets full in the way we regularly conduct our lives, those buckets are gonna become empty. That's just the cost of living. And so let's take these buckets, this relationships bucket. You know, I got, I got a relationship with my aging parents, with my siblings, with my wife, with my kids, with my friends. I, got, I have to put effort towards all of those buckets. Now, they're, they are of varying sizes, but I know for sure that my, my, the hole that's at the bottom of my bucket for my aging parents, it's a tiny little hole. It's this little tiny puny hole. All I got to do is call them once a week, talk to them for 10 minutes. And they're like, oh, Unker, you're the good son. They're great. That's, a, that's an easy bucket to keep full. But that bucket earlier that I described called my back pain bucket, man, the hole at the bottom of that bucket is freaking huge. If I don't do something every day, every day of my life, to keep that bucket full, it's going to empty out because I'm just naturally predisposed to back pain and neck pain. That, But it's important to me that I keep that bucket full. It's important that I'm robust as I get older. So I have to keep that bucket full. I got to make sure that my routine is that my routine, just like brushing my teeth, that there is something that I'm doing to keep that back and neck strong and flexible. So what I want you all to do is examine your buckets. What are the things that are valuable in your life? And how are you gonna keep those things full? And how are you gonna maintain fullness knowing that there's a hole at the bottom of all your buckets? If you do that, I think you're gonna live an extraordinary life. You're gonna live a fulfilled life. And when you're on that deathbed, you're gonna look back and say, I like what I did. I'm happy and I'm proud and I feel meaning in my time on this earth. All right, I have to make a shameless plug. Every year um, in the summer, I do a Happy Dentist, Happy Teams retreat. This year I've secured a yoga instructor. I've secured four practice management speakers along with myself. I've secured a foam rolling instructor. We're gonna do morning hikes and watch the sunrise. And we have a stand-up comedy, stand-up comedian after happy hour on Friday night. So the comedian is Carlos Rodriguez. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Our speakers are Anissa Holmes, um, Chad Duplantis, D'Angelo Webster, uh, Laura Mock and myself. And so if you want to take your team to something really, really extraordinary, I put a lot of effort into making this an amazing retreat. It's two days. If you want more information about it, just visit my website, thehappydentistretreat.com. Before we give you the code, I do want to let you know that this was an honorarium-based presentation. And so I was lucky enough to have two sponsors sponsor this presentation. Now, the reason that these sponsors did this is because I'm a major customer of theirs. I use Shofu products, especially their iSpecial camera on a regular basis. I use actually the iSpecial on every single new patient, every single consult and every single emergency because it's such an easy camera to use. 
the the pictures are incredible and it's very very easy like a point and shoot only it gets really really nice photos especially in the back of the mouth it it does excellent before and after photos and so i appreciate shofu's sponsorship and i i wouldn't talk about them if i didn't use them myself the second sponsor was kettenbach for those of you who are using regular impression materials that are expensive i really want to encourage you to try giving kettenbach a try Kettenbach, it's an impression material that is manufactured in Germany, and they don't distribute through the major distributors, Benko, Shine, and, and Patterson, and therefore they're able to keep their fees very low. And that's actually what, um, that's, that's how I was introduced to Kettenbach. I was using really nice, expensive impression material, but it was so freaking expensive. So I met up with um, a Kettenbach rep, uh, Jason, up in the up in Ohio, and he said, "Listen, use our product through through a um, a jumbo uh, a jumbo capsule with an auto mix, and my impressions are freaking sweet." Um, Ken Buck, they also sell a lot of products like um, core material, uh, cement material. I use their cement um, pretty much exclusively, and so. Uh, if you're looking for impression material along with cement and core material, um, Kettenbach has really, really nice products. And of course, if you want to just follow me, I'm not big on social media. I wish I was. Everybody who's big as a public speaker, they're like, yo, Gupta, you have to be better at social media. I'm trying, but I'm not that great at it. But if you want to see where I'm speaking if you want, if you're interested in having me speak for one of your seminars coming up, um, I'm very easy to get a hold of either through email, through my website, through Facebook or Instagram. Um, that's how you get a hold of me. So it's 847. I finished a little bit early. Uh, looks like we have, oh, Lisa says, if you have questions regarding this program, you can email her. I do want to type in my email address one more time um, on the chat so that you can um, send me an email if you have any questions or if you just want to try something out. And um, for the like, let's say you want to do a Veterans Day event and you're like, God, where do I even get started? I actually I recorded a video um, that I can just send you for free. Um, on how we did our Veterans Day event, where this year will be our sixth year um, doing a Veterans Day event. And we've learned a lot and uh, you don't have to go through all the speed bumps that we did. Um, so anyway, there's my email address. I respond to every single email I get. Um, not super timely, but I respond to every email I get. Thanks for the opportunity and for all the rest of you. Thanks for sticking with me for the last two hours. It's really been a pleasure. Uh, uh, Frederick, Sonny, Heidi, uh, Zaginta. Um, I, I might be forgetting a couple of you. Thanks so much for, for contributing, um, for, for making this, making me feel like I was actually talking uh, directly to people. This has really, really been fun. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.